Welcome to Ohm Times TV, a division of Ohm Times Media and Broadcasting. Welcome to Adventures in Consciousness, the interactive show that offers expansive conversation with pioneering new thought teachers and personal real-time guided journeys into the imaginal realm to access your soul's wisdom and discover how to live your greater story. Here is your host, human potentialist, soul mentor, and consciousness guide, Jennifer Ivanko. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another Adventures in Consciousness, The Conversation. Today's guest is social scientist, writer, and international lecturer, Asperide Ananas Amatista. She has studied in universities in several countries and holds three master's degrees, including psychosociology from Milan University, communication from NYU, and she has an honorary PhD in wisdom studies from the U Wisdom University. Asperide has complementary training in transformative peace negotiations, energy healing, and is a soul collage certified facilitator. I've known Asperide for many years now, and I've had the privilege to attend some of her very powerful and unique workshops, including her Inner Senses, which is one of my favorites. Um, Asperide, welcome to the conversation. Thank you, Jennifer. Hi, convoy. Hello, with you. Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me on your wonderful show. I'm, I'm very excited to have you today, Asperity, because any time I get to spend with you is, is always illuminating and exciting and actually sometimes mind-bending. <laughs> um, today, we're going to continue this theme that I've been uh, with my guest about uh, dimensions of the human experience. And uh, you have recently written a book called 33 Lives. Actually, you yeah. can yeah. And, and we're really excited to um, explore not only the, this concept, yeah, there you go, we can see it, <laughs> from the book of time. So those are actually two topics that I really want to explore with you today is the, the idea of past lives or whatever you want to consider calling it and uh, time in that time territory. But before we begin, I think it's important, um, you live in a federation of communities, of spiritual communities known as Dom and Her. I'd love to give a little sense of how that has um, informed you, your research and what you're doing. So tell us a little yeah. bit about that. So 30 years ago, I felt a very strong calling towards uh, more community and also a, a different approach to spirituality. That would be uh, combining, you know, sci-fi ideas of mm -hmm. us as beings that live in an intelligent, sentient cosmos, together with the idea of the essence of all the philosophies and religions of the past. And I found it here in this place called Damanur, that at the time was a rather small uh, center for studies and a community here in the pre Alps of Piedmont in Italy. And now it's a much larger center. We're known all over the world, especially for the wonderful temples of humankind. They are this uh, artistic complex of temples built by hand inside a mountain. And uh, the, the temples and the experiences I had in them over many years have really transformed me. I would love to say that I'm one of the builders of the temples, but it is not true. <laughs> when I came here, they were mostly built, but I have contributed in my way a little bit, very little bit with the artistic work in there, but then immediately with the, the writing about them. So I wrote over the years a couple of books on the temples alone and with other Damanurians. I have uh, really, you know, written many, many articles, I made videos, everything possible to reach as many people in the world that we could reach with this message that this is a new time, there is a new relationship with the divine, and the divine within can be exalted in building temples, but temples are really there to be containers of the new energies that are now coming to help us awaken. So that's why they're called the temples of humankind. And if you want to check them out, because they're incredible, difficult to describe, uh, the yes, really difficult to describe, the website is simply www.thetemples.org. Yes, the temples, not even the word dominant, just thetemples.org. Thetemples.org. 
And then if you wanted to discover a little more the why, the motivation, who are the people that build them and what we offer, because we have uh, people coming from all over the world, luckily again, now that it's so really often, um, we offer seminars, we have different schools, dreaming school, alchemy school, um, the seminars that I am teaching together with others, you mentioned the inner senses that we consider them to be like the awakening essentials. Because whatever your practice is, whatever you study, whether, whether you study in Dhamma or anywhere else, they really help accelerate this um, retrieval of parts of our soul, of parts of what are our unique faculties that came to us when we started being beings with a divine spark in them and aware of being such. You know, it's interesting. You mentioned sci-fi right when you first started. And an aspect of um, your courses and, and other courses is this idea of it starts almost as sci-fi, but then it becomes more grounded and more like a reality. So you look towards our, what, how we fantasize and what we imagine for movies and, and then it becomes real. At Dom and Her, it seems real. <laughs> And, you know, if we go with the idea, which I really think is what resonates with me the most, that thoughts, ideas, what we call imaginations, do not come from inside of us, but they come from the field outside of us, then whatever is thought of, fantasized about, must exist somewhere. Maybe with different shades, but somewhere it exists because we are not making it up. We are just, you know, um, tuning our antennas to that possibility. So, you know, in that sense, I think sci-fi is very inspiring on, for uh, help us ponder what could be possible. And then seeing, as you say, how to ground it here. Make so it that we, yeah, yeah come a little bit of our um, limitations or at least what we think are our limitations. Yeah, that's the one thing when I visited Dom and her, um, you have all these ideas that we have in, in meditation, human potential, whatever, but in Dom and Her, you're trying to live them and trying to um, really ground it, make it practical. It's not just a wow yeah. experience. What is it? And also to remind us that really we're here to divinize matter. So, you know, our um, the basis of our philosophy is not so much that we are here to have a quick experience and go to a superior reality. The idea is that, oh, sure, that will happen also at a certain point, hopefully. But the idea is that we bring everything with us. So the whole um, planet, you know, the earth, everything, matter itself becomes divine. And that what for us it means to evolve and transcend. All of us together, we are an ecosystem. You know, this is a word that is used very often, but we think of an ecosystem in a very expanded way, including the divine forces and the tiny bacteria. So all of this together evolves. The earth herself is now changing, right? We know that the Schumann resonance is changing constantly, having peaks and going down. And this is also destabilizing many people that are not grounded in the spiritual practice because we are affected by the changes of our planet. We are her. And she is us. So when that changes so uh, abruptly, we are not used to it. So I think a spiritual practice is important and it's important to see I'm doing this so I can ground it and I can really change the frequency also of everything around me. So so I, that brings me into this book, this 33 yeah. Lives, that, um, you know, yeah, first no. of all, again. <laughs> <laughs> why, well, I'm, why? Very, I'm very proud of the of the cover because it's a <laughs> photograph that I took of myself in a place and this staircase were so amazing and I took this photo and I thought one day I will use it for something special and here it is <laughs> so so you know when you talk about um past lives yes why why do we want to even go there why do we want to look at past lives so um, I don't particularly believe that there are past lives. Mm -hmm. I, 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 my conviction is that uh, there are lives in which our essence is experiencing life within forms in a body simultaneously. It is, they are past lives 
from the point of view of now. So, you know, if I have a life in ancient Rome, yes, ancient Rome from my point of view of now is past. But from the point of view of my essence, that is who I really am because I'm not this body. I, I am, I think I'm an antenna that is um, connected to a specific signal. That signal is the same across time. So if we look at this in this way, one of the reasons why it's relevant, because we learn to live with this paradox. And when you live in this paradox that I am now and I have past lives from this point of view, but at the same time, they're all existing now, something changes in the perception of reality and we become more expanded. So this is one reason. Another reason, whether they're past lives, contemporaneous, or even just archetypes, they play out in us. They have an influence. So I might want to, to explore which parts of myself are playing a role in my life, in the way I approach situations, people, uh, challenges, and so that I know myself better. So in that sense, it's a process of soul retrieval that becomes, again, very grounded because in the process that I lead, um, you actually become that person for you know a day half a day two days according to how long the process is and according to how much time you dedicate to this you can meet this person from when they're born to when they die so, so again a process that you lead a little bit you, you lead a process yes. yes exactly i lead a process to help people remember who they were and this is also very interesting. In the beginning, um, in my tradition, in the Damanurian tradition, we were doing this work always with asking the person to give us their photographs and their birth data so that we could research among the many contemporaneous slash past lives they have, the one that was more relevant for them at that time. So in my book, I have put 33 lives that I researched for 33 people over 20 years. But the process that I lean now, because this is many years after, I actually have discovered or I see that, you know, consciousness is growing. We are becoming more aware. So now I lead people to find their precious, important, special lives by themselves, by setting an objective. So, you know, the objective is something that they want now. Do I want to change something in my life because I want more courage or because I want to have less of an ingredient in my life or I want to connect to a part of me that was a great leader or was a healer or was dedicated to the goddess, whatever that meant, you know, whether if it was a mother or a priestess or a wonderful cook that was feeding everyone. So... So by, because again, as I said before, if we can think of it, it means that somewhere we have it. We would not imagine something of us if we don't have it somewhere. So then I can help people find across the different probabilities of time, which one is that point of time in which they've had that experience. And then we can choose if what we want is more of that experience, which means increasing the communication with that particular part of yourself or decreasing if you want a healing of something, for instance. Or maybe you say, you know, the, when I get the communication is good, but it's not constant. I would like to stabilize it because maybe it's a part of me that is very creative. And I would like to be more creative more often. Right? Mm -hmm. So the person chooses what the objective is. And then I guide them. And... Um, we go through this whole process, always saying also, why is it relevant now? So what I really love about this, my, this new development of my work is that it becomes so relevant for the person now. So it's, it's not about finding, again, that wow experience of, wow, I was this kind of person, or I did it, but it's something practical right now. And I love the idea from a human potential standpoint, we are always looking at ways to access more of ourselves more abilities and more things that we can apply to our life right now. And you're, what yeah. you're explaining is, is another technique to reach some tools and activate yourself. Exactly. And also, I would say it adds an extra layer of relationship with time itself. Because, you know, once you do this, you will never perceive time in the same way. Because these tools, this experience 
in that is really wow because then you realize that time is actually flexible malleable uh living even even you know like you can approach it as a living dimension in which you can move and navigate because what i find really really interesting for instance is sometimes people arrive with an objective and the person that they find is the one that needs healing from them now so you start seeing that you really actually are this transmission and in different points of time you uh, experience that in different ways but you can from here also affect the past which in turn will affect how you are now when you feel it this in your cells because you have not only the memory activated, but your body that starts thinking, feeling, even desiring the food that that person maybe in ancient Egypt desired, it becomes really real. <laughs> it's funny, really real. It becomes very real and uh, really changes something in you. So I'm very passionate about this. Awesome. I also just came back from a seminar that I just taught that was uh, interesting also with some, even these were uh, business people they were interested more in you know expanding their leadership and all of this and at the same time it was amazing because they came with that and then they also met the human side of it and that's what really then touched them even more than what your their objective was in the beginning do you find that often that people come with the one objective but they actually shift or change when they start really experiencing this other life or this what I always find is that people do not expect the depth, the magnitude of the emotion. You know, yeah. because maybe they're used of doing this through hypnosis or um, other methods, which are valid, they're really, really good. But this one is all based on the idea that the connection that you can make with that person to open the time door is based on emotions. Those are what, that is the element that leaves a trace from lifetime to lifetime. We forget because there is also the trauma of being born that, you know, cancers, um, the emotions, they're not so deep, but the ones that are deep, they're the ones that can really guide us across the ocean of time. So let's play a little bit in that time in the in time territory. And I love how you say the sphere of time. What, what does this mean? What is, what is this time territory? Concept. Yeah, so we're normally used to thinking of time as a line, right? So I'm here now and then we'll have a future. And for sure, if I look back, there is a past. But if I were to ask you, Jennifer, now, mm -hmm. is the Eiffel Tower there in Paris? What would you answer? Of course, yes. Yeah. And do you really know that it's there? I don't see it right now, but I yes, it's there. <laughs> right, but you don't really know. The truth yeah. is you don't know. You say yes, because you assume, because we are used to thinking of territories as something that exists contemporaneously. So even if you're not seeing it, you say, OK, well, the Eiffel Tower is there. Probably also, uh, you know, the Time Mahal in, in India probably is there and probably also Trafalgar Square. Mm -hmm. It would be easy for you to think that. But the truth is, in your direct experience, you have no way of knowing. But we've been used to think, okay, no problem. I believe that those places are there. Okay, what if we could substitute the idea of a map of place with the idea of a map of time and applying exactly the same assumptions? Yes, with my senses now, I cannot ascertain that ancient Rome exists. But if I were to apply the same logic of the Eiffel Tower, then I could say with certainty, yes, it does exist. <laughs> right? And yeah, yeah. And then once you believe that, then then possibilities open up, right? Exactly. And even if you don't believe it, but you just say, okay, let's use this as a work hypothesis and let's see what happens. What if this were true? You know, I, I'm not a, a great fan of believing, even though it has a great power. I have a, I'm a great fan of believing after I say, what if, and I just give it a try. Then I can believe that is more expanded than actually what I'm experiencing. Then yes, but a little bit of experience I like to have. <laughs> no, beautiful. So I like that concept. And with time, then you can actually move around within this territory. Exactly. And another very interesting idea, right, if we continue with this metaphor, is that now if you were to go to Paris, let's say in Paris it's a beautiful city, 
You could choose many ways to go to Paris. You could choose to come to me first, for instance, to Italy, right? Or you could choose to go to India and then go to Paris. It would be a little long, but you can do it, right? Because everything is the same. So if we think of time in the same way, this means that when we are looking at our different incarnations in time, they're not linear. So it's not like we have a first incarnation in prehistory and then we go to the Etruscans and then we go to the Greeks and then we go, no, it doesn't, that's not how it works. I might have my next incarnation much, much farther back in time than now. Because what changes, what determines where we go is again the signal of the transmission, which is influenced by the complexity of the civilization. So if I live a full life and I really use my spiritual gifts, maybe my next lifetime, I'm not in the next future, the next 100 years that looking at now don't look so incredibly easy, let's put it this way. Maybe I will go back in time to a very advanced civilizations. And by advanced, I mean the arts, connection with nature, connection with people, the ability to speculate, you know, to really live not only here for now, but with the connection with the beyond, maybe I will go to an indigenous people because their civilization are very often much more complex than what we live now in our society. Of course, the people that are watching this and people like you and hopefully I hope also people like me, we are pockets that are making a difference. So we are really very complex. And, and probably how we live or what we think of is one of the most complex um, that time has offered. This would not be true of society at large, at least not definitely not in Western society today. It's interesting. This brings up so many questions about, you know, what is a highly advanced society? And you're, you're pointing that it's not always high technology. Sometimes it's, it's depth in art and, and these other connection with the world around them or something else that would make it a more complex, as you say. Yeah, high technology is only high technology. <laughs> it's only things. But yeah. if high technology does not have consciousness in it, then we are not in good shape. <laughs> because then we really confuse. We get confused, you know, just because machines can do things for us, but we actually lose, uh, you know, what our potential is. If on the contrary, we can put infused consciousness inside the machine, that is fantastic because then we can have more time, less work, you know, what's called work and work, more personal development for the advancement of all and everyone and everything. Beautiful, beautifully said, yes. Well, I think we uh, need to go to break and I wanna come back and, and talk more with the spare day. Um, we will be right back, thank you. Thank you. Real Conscious Connection, Ohm Times Radio, IOM FM. Ohm Times Magazine is one of the leading online content providers of positivity, wellness, and personal empowerment, a philanthropic organization. Their net proceeds are funneled to support worldwide charity initiatives via Humanity Healing International. Through their commitment to creating community and providing conscious content, they aspire to uplift humanity on a global scale. Ohm Times co-creating a more conscious lifestyle. Hello, I'm Sandy Sedgbeer, host of Om Times Magazine's flagship radio show, What is Going Om? My passion is sifting through information, research, and innovations from new thought teachers, speakers, and researchers, pushing back the boundaries of what we know about life, energy, metaphysics, and the universe. I love shifting perceptions about who we are, why we're here, and how quickly impossible becomes normal when we open our minds, expand our awareness, and accept that the only limits that exist are those we place upon ourselves. So if you're the kind of forward-thinking, eager investigator of what lies beyond the current reality that most perceive, why not make a date to come play with me in the field of possibilities at 4 p.m. Pacific Time, 7 p.m. Eastern Time every Thursday, and together we can discover what's really going on. There is no greater mystery in life than you. So why not take a fully experiential plunge into the depths of your being to uncover and retrieve all the secrets and wisdom your soul is crying out for you to know? 
If you enjoy Adventures in Consciousness, the conversation, you'll love Adventures in Consciousness, the course. Join Jennifer in this unique 13-week series of journeys specifically designed to unlock the mysteries of yourself. Each week, you'll journey progressively deeper into the meta realm where, freed from the limitations of your mind, you'll get to play and explore the inner and outer reaches of your awareness. The next series of Adventures in Consciousness, the course, is starting soon. Find out more and stake your place at jenniferivanko.com. There was an old woman who lived in a shoe. She had so many children, she didn't know what to do. She gave them some broth without any bread and kissed them all soundly and put them to bed. Hunger is a story we can end. End it at feedingamerica.org. Hello and welcome back. I'm speaking to Asperide Amatista and um, we're talking about time and past lives and her new book, 33 Lives. Uh, Asperide, <laughs> and she loves <laughs> um, Asperide, you, you mentioned a couple of times about antennas and that fascinated me when I was reading your book. You, you spoke about Bruce Lipton's research and some other people's research. Can you tell us a little more about that, about antennas? Yeah. So let, let's see, um, the, the most advanced instruments to measure the brain now do not actually use any probes that touch the, 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 the head. They can, yeah, they can measure the electromagnetic field around us and they actually can tell what we're thinking and what is going on in the body. So they are a very simple way to demonstrate that we are not locked inside this, you know, bio suit, as Bruce Lipson calls it, the body. It's a bio suit that we wear. But what is the we? What is the I that is wearing this? What is that consciousness? And where does it come from? So if we are not this, we have to understand that the brain is just the physical support for the mind, which is a completely different thing, the brain and the mind. So the mind is the result of the brain activity in conjunction with every other activity that is around us so the field so whatever thought i am emitting is going out of me and affecting others and whatever thoughts others are emitting is affecting me and then if we start taking this to a more metaphysical level then we can say well maybe it's not just the thoughts of humans it's the thoughts and the dreams because dreams also support thoughts the dreams and the thoughts of everything that lives on our planet and maybe we can even go a little beyond and think, oh, maybe I can even connect to dimensions like time, for instance. If time were a dimension that is not just uh, what scientists do not know what it is, right? If you wear something we knew what you wear and it was something that we can interact with, then my antenna could do this. And my antenna my can also connect to higher and higher levels of consciousness, the divine, uh, or the world of ideas where we get inspiration. So I think this is a very beautiful way of looking at ourselves because it gives us much more opportunities. And again, in my book, what I've discovered with so many years of, of uh, research, which is also very much in tune with the philosophy of Dharma, is the idea that each one of us represents a frequency. You can call it an alchemical element or to make it very simple, let's call it a color. Let's say that I am violet. So what is violet? The body? No. is the information and energy that come from the field, that come from my node of consciousness, come through, find this suitable body to connect and give me an experience. But I will be that violet, that information and energy in every one of my lives across time. Why am I always the same? Not because it's boring all of the country, because at each lifetime, the stage changes for me to explore it till I become the most beautiful, brilliant violet with all the possible shades of violet. So let's say that for one person, the element is um, to bring beauty into 
uh, the world. Maybe in one lifetime, they're born very beautiful. Maybe in another lifetime, they're an amazing painter that creates beauty. Maybe in another one, are there teachers that elicit beauty from their students? In another one, you could be a carpenter or a chef, you know, you would be exploring what is the essence of a poet, of course, the essence of beauty in every possible shade of the human experience or innovation. Well, sometimes maybe you are an innovator because you are a great mind and a scientist. Another time you go and fight the French Revolution. <laughs> but you explore what innovation, innovation means in every way possible till you have all the shades and then you can really offer this back to consciousness and then your journey being violet or whatever it is is finished and then you decide how do i progress what is the next stage but i so think this is interesting is like we're playing a you know a role uh, play game um we are outside of time that's where we are. We transmit to our different body suits or bio suits, and then we and then we play this game. And that, that's you know exciting when you think about you. Know, you mentioned how um, if I can think about it or dream it, then I have access to it. And if I have a certain frequency or a certain color, then my my um, desire to expand that and in this life I can attract those different um, desires and dreams from different lives and enrich the color that I'm bringing right here, right now. I, I think that's fascinating. It's again, from human potential, that's what yeah. we want. It is, and also it gives you mark, m much more clarity on your mission, you know, who you are, why you're here. So you don't, you know, you be more focused. This is why I'm here. And it also makes it, your mission, not not uh, something you have to find it, sh share with somebody else as far as their mission. That idea of we all have our own mountain peaks to get on. It's not like I'm trying to be competitive. I'm trying to find my beautiful essence so I can share it. Yeah, also because we can really find our own beautiful essence if others do the same with theirs. Otherwise, we just keep creating confusion, you know, cacophony instead of having a beautiful symphony. In a symphony, each note is pure per se, and then they get together and they create a symphony. They don't mix with the other notes, like losing their identity. They mix by keeping their identity. Yeah, beautiful. I love that. So I, I wanted to um, circle back to some of these uh, lives that you, you bring up in the 33 lives, because they're fascinating. I mean, from when I was reading, they are mostly what we would consider past from this perspective. Yes. However, yes. however, they actually get very far past and, and almost alien in some cases when you look at ancient Egypt or, or even um, Atlantis. Mm -hmm. So how do you come up with these particular, and, and does everybody have a, a, a life like that? I assume, yes. So my idea, what motivated me to write this book was the understanding that actually, uh, you know, we basically have all had, had the same life experiences. So I thought if I can write these stories, uh, maybe they can elicit memories in other people. And this is what I'm actually getting now as a comment, mostly from Italians, because the book came out first in Italian. So more people have read it in Italian. They're saying, you know, I am having dreams or certain stories really resonate. It sounds like it's my story. And this was exactly why I wanted to write this book, to help all of us remember who we are. And, and you know, uh, a story, again, is a frequency that can connect you to yours if it was yours. And um, several years ago, when I was doing this research for a person, I um, went into a very deep, um, trance is too much to say, but a very deep meditative state. And I received this life, which is the one that I chose to put as the first story, hmm. because that's the one that made me also decide to write the book. And this life is an alien, but a third generation alien on planet Earth. So there the first generation of these people uh, crash on planet Earth. And all they think about is, how do we get back? We want to go back to our planet. Their sons and daughters also 
want to go back, but they realize it's impossible. They won't be able to go back. They need to adapt to planet Earth. So they create a third generation, and that's the story of the person I found is one of them, third generation, that are built to stay on planet Earth. So they modify them genetically in order to be more suitable to be outdoors, to be you know adapted to planet Earth, to eat more foods. But they make one main change also, fascinating. The original people were a group mind and they were constantly um, directed by the spaceship itself. As the spaceship was losing its power, that was not possible anymore. So the main difference that they have to make in the third generation is to give each one of them an individual identity. The first time for those people. So this alien person who's earthly by that point describes how incredibly amazing exhilarating was for them to feel an I for the first time and how that actually increased intimacy and a completely different way of living. There are many other things in the story that I won't reveal, <laughs> but at the end of the story, they realized that these um, genetic changes made them live much short, shorter than their parents and their ancestors. So this person dies quite young. And as he's dying, he sees a whole program. He can see across many, many um, timelines, down, 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 far away in the future. And he sees and perceives that there is a plan of reunification to bring them back to their unity, but this time keeping at the same time their individuality. Mm -hmm. And that would be done through a new feeling called love. Beautiful. So this is the story that made me want to write the book. And all the other stories that I chose are all stories of people that are true to this. And again, you know, I was talking before about the French Revolution. I do have a person that was in the French Revolution. And at the end they say, oh, was this right? Maybe, you know, it was very violent. I hope this was really for the right reason. But how many ways, in how many epochs, we tried, we strived to go back to that unity, to the sense we are one of real community. So... And then the last story is also a story of someone that did something similar, and this time by collecting the life story of as many people as possible. Again, to create a sort of an arc of human experience towards unity. Yeah, beautiful. It, these, these stories, they're, they're short, but like you said, they do um, make you touch them. It touches deep something deep inside of you, and then it doesn't bring memories. Um, and it it's interesting to me um, that it is certain ones, certain stories do seem to give you pause, like you can just feel yourself in the story. It's very nice. Yeah. Um, I also noticed these aren't just stories about 33 lives, but they're 33 deaths in that trench. That's an important part, right? That for me is very important. It's a very important part in the seminars that I teach. And it was a very important part in these uh, stories because, uh, well, if we have the experience of dying, of death, of accompanying someone that is actually us <laughs> towards the process, we completely change our, our relation with death. And we really understand and feel and instruct ourselves, remind ourselves that it's only a passage. And I think this is invaluable to have this experience in us. So we are not afraid when this happens because we are sure that it's going to happen, right? For all of us, it's going to happen. So it's much better to have had an experience where we see that there is a passage only and then we continue. This particular stories I chose, most of these people, actually I would say all of them, die consciously. Not they, they don't all have the same level of spiritual awareness. So some really prepare and go, uh, you know, when they want. But they're all aware that the death is coming and they have the time to prepare and receive it with dignity. And this was also a message I really wanted to convey, how important it is to prepare, how important it is, even if it happens suddenly. But if we thought about it during our life, then we die with dignity. And that sometimes that moment of dying gives a different meaning to the whole life. And there are a few stories like that. 
when just at the moment of dying, the people, because they, they have the possibility of recollecting, they really fully realize what was the meaning of their life. Hmm. So that, very that, that did impress me. I mean, the, the, they were all, I, yes, they were all conscious deaths, it seemed, even the ones that were real quick, they just seemed to flow into that next, next life for the transition. So beautiful. Um, you know, I'm just, there's so many different things that I'm, I'm my mind just spinning right now from, from especially when we talk about time and, and time sphere. Um, where, where do you go from the, these, you know, past lives and you're bringing it into the understanding into this life? So now, now I'm understanding, what do I do with this information? You know, well, I think there are two levels of answer possible. Let's start with the uh, bigger one. I, I really feel that these are crucial times for transpersonal growth. So I feel that whenever one of us is becoming more aware and we offer this increase in awareness to the field, we are helping everyone elevate. And I, I always wonder, what if we were living in societies where everyone was aware that we live contemporaneously in multiple points of time? How would that change our idea of responsibility towards others, towards the planet? Not in the sense of karma, uh, because karma is, okay, I do something and then I get rewarded or punished. No, 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 no. What if we had the awareness that this is an ongoing game and what I'm doing here can affect what I'm doing somewhere else in time and it's a constant network that is constantly moving till we get to these moments in which time gets solidified somehow. The results of experience cannot be changed anymore. But till then, which is, you know, um, in our philosophy, sometimes we call it uh, moments of divine attention, but also uh, science says that there are moments in which the universe resets. And in those moments when it resets, it's because you say, okay, how much complexity, how much information, how much energy, how much experience have I created? Let's see, and let's start again. Uh, also, the Vedas have a similar moment to, um, concept when they say yuga ends and a new starts. But that's a moment of um, reckoning what's going on, what has happened, and how do we start again. So what if everyone were thinking in this way? Collectively, how would that change society? Now, then the idea also of what am I doing as an impact on the next seven generations? This was so crucial for indigenous people because they knew that they were going to be the seventh generation. It was so clear. I'm doing this for my children's children because my children's children is going to be me. Right? Yeah. So it's not a selfish way of thinking. It's a holistic way of thinking. If I know I'm coming back, then maybe I really want to take care of this planet for my children's children because it's going to be me again. Wow. I, I'd known about, you know, indigenous looking at, at generations forward, but I hadn't put that other thought of, well, that's going to be me coming back. That's interesting. Yes. This is of all indigenous people have this belief. I mean, in Italy, and I know in many other traditions still, but in Italy till uh, what well, my generation, uh, it was uh, usual to get the name of your grandfather or your grandmother. Because this came from a very ancient understanding that it was your grandfather coming back through you. So you always skip one generation, but the one after, it was them coming back. Of course, not, again, when we think of this uh, past lives reincarnation, it's not that all of me is going to be back into another person, only what I've distilled. So when there are parts of us, that they are like uh, frozen um, uh, past lives in a freeze frame of what we've distilled at the end. When I go and do a, a conscious process of acting, that part of me as a past life, then I can see the whole film of the life, not just the freeze frame of what I have actually achieved at the end of my life. Wow. So that's interesting because, you know, you think of these past lives and you do think of the whole story, but you're saying it's that distilled part is, becomes part of me. That's what you're saying, right? 
That's the right. distillation of that life is a part of you. So you were asking me why it could be useful. At a personal level, we have these archetypes, if you want to call them that, or personalities, if you want. They are freeze frames, okay? Mm -hmm. The moment they die, basically, how much they've realized there. They could have died at 20, like at 95. But when you go and contact them as a past or contemporaneous life of yours, let's use past because it's simpler, a past life of yours, then at that moment, moment, you can meet them when they were born till the way they die. You can see and relive the whole experience. Then you will understand why that is the essence that you have in you. What were the challenges that they had to face? Why they made those choices? And sometimes when you meet them in motion in the movie, you might really not like the choices they made. But if you can understand that in those under those circumstances, in that times, they were thinking, feeling very differently, and you forgive them or accept them or welcome them, then you're welcoming a part of you now. Beautiful. And so we go inward and we open this door in time, basically, to, to experience this. And then I love the part where you were saying we it's not a one-way street. It's it, we're time being that sphere. So now we are interacting with something that is contemporary right now with us and we can share back and forth right yeah exactly exactly so th this this we have an effect and or an impact right now yes and not not just this lonely this this continuous story of oh, it's only me how can i make any changes but it's you across all of time it's many me's across all of time and that it's moves. also very interesting because sometimes when you move back in time or through time to a different point in time and you meet someone who was very conscious, they know you're coming. And within their own context, it could be that they think it's a special dream or a bird talking to them, you know, or some kind of mystical experience that makes sense to them. But you realize that they, because, because you feel they look, look at you, that you feel they feel you're there. Also, sometimes at the time of death, this has happened to me. I've had that experience, yeah, with, with my fifth past life. We did, in Dom and Her, in one of these workshops, we do we would do a number of past lives, but the fifth one is a very important one just in that time. But it was to meet yourself in a very different context because very different beliefs, understandings, culture, everything. But have that under that, I guess, that recognition because of the frequency, as you said, the color. Exactly. Yeah. And that's why you can, because it is your color. Otherwise, you couldn't go there. So, you know, the the work that we do, we have developed here at Damaro is to make sure that you are running along your own timeline, whether you are recollecting something that we have already researched for you. So then we open that road or whether you are the one choosing who do you want to meet and then we guide you to find them. But that is uh, the big part of the facilitator. And then, you know, the, the, the spiritual techniques that we use here um, to make sure that you are on your timeline. <laughs> you know, there's one other thing I want to touch on before we finish here. And, and, and that's also the idea that this color, this frequency isn't just in a human form. It's oh, also oh, thank you. Thank you for reminding me of that because it's very important. Absolutely. So again, you know, as we do not have the idea of karma as a, um, punishment or, you know, but a little more of a, a game with different points. The other, the other um, important is that we are at the same time in animals, in plants, and of course also in crystals, even though it's difficult for us to perceive that because their experience of the flow of time is so different. But yes, this violet frequency, the blue, the purple, the green is permeating everything. So we are having an experience in these many forms contemporaneously. So, you know, we talk about, I might have an affinity to dogs and it might be because that's a very close life to me right now. In also, well, with dogs is also, you know, if we go a little more into the esoteric, which also is confirmed by anthropology, uh, dogs, it is as if they somehow made a pact with humanity 
to really be a part of us. You know, there are um, several theories of how dogs came into being, and apparently it happened uh, with wolves that actually accepted to be domesticated in exchange for food. Um, there's, there are um, studies on this, like a very special, super cold, rigid winter. So a pack of wolves at a certain point decided, okay, we're going to give up part of our freedom in exchange for this. And, um, and there are also spiritual stories about this idea that dogs really decided to unite their destiny, including their spiritual destiny, to that of humans which other animals didn't do, even though they share the, you know, the lives with us. But for instance, cats are much more independent. So spiritually, they have their own line. And of course, we can also be in them. But with dogs, it's a very, very special choice that dogs made. Yeah, nice. So um, I want to touch on also your, your name, if you can <laughs> talk about your name. Yeah. Really. <laughs> <laughs> so the reason you choose these names you want to tell yes. us about yeah so so in Damanor we have um like many spiritual schools this idea that as you transform yourself spiritually and as you grow it's also important that you remember more and more and more that you're part also of the planet and all the other living beings so my first name is Peride uh, comes from the Greek mythology in that mythology, they were the guardians of the tree of knowledge, and the myth is the equivalent of the Garden of Eden in the Bible, uh, same myth. But it's also a large family of butterflies that only fly at sunset. So my second name, Ananas, is Sanskrit, same in many languages, but unfortunately not in English, it's pineapple. And so because I chose a name that was connected to sunset, I want a fruit full of sunshine <laughs> so i chose that and then amethyst that means amethyst and uh, is the most recent name that i acquired and i chose it because i love amethyst i love the color and i love their healing properties so again it's not so much to you know, for us to become more glory constant reminders of our responsibility towards all the other kingdoms of nature and our planet. And and a connection or reminder that that's part of you, right? That I mean when you talk yes. about this frequency. Exactly. And a reminder that it's a part of us. Yes. Yes. Always in two ways. You are always a mirror within and without. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> so so Sparita, can you tell us what what are you working on now? What can um, you have this book you've published and you yeah. are what else? So, uh, like newer projects, well, right now, I really would like to concentrate as after the summer is, is going on working on more, uh, bringing this work more to people, so more seminars, more um, work with people. I'm also working with Selfica, which is this very specific, uh, special Damanurian technology, and I am going to start guiding meditations and experiences also online. And this is very profound uh, consciousness expanding uh, technologies, as, as you know, because you have a lot of experience with that. Yes. And then if I have time, I would like to also continue with my work with women, uh, my Alchemy of Her program, yes. because we women are awakening so quickly that I think we can make a lot of change in the world, have a lot of impact. And also it's a great opportunity to get to know ourselves more. What is that distinct divine feminine and how do we embrace the masculine inside of us so that we're fully complete and then we can embrace the masculine with joy outside of us. Beautiful. Yes. And, you know, how would somebody get in touch with you for some of these things that you've um, you said, especially that doing the past life and that self-directed research? Yeah. How Just email. Email me. My name, my first name is Peride at... Damanur, D-A-M-A-N-H-U-R dot org. And maybe we can write it or they find it on my book. And the book should be available on Amazon. It's already available as an ebook. So beautiful. Yeah. Yes. So thank you very much, Sparede, for being with us today. And I look forward to, um, we've been working with Alchemy of Her, her last course, which was phenomenal. And we have talking about maybe a future of another course a little deeper without me of her. So thank you very much for your time.
Thank you. Thank you. And Thank you. All. Like to, yes. And I'd like to invite everybody else to join me again at our next episode. We will be uh, doing the experiential part of this um, show and we'll be taking some trips into time and exploring that territory of time. So please join me in two weeks. And until then, have a beautiful day. Thank you.